Welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia for another episode of Criminals, Cutthroats and Convicts. In this episode, we look at part two of Australia's Ghost Ships. In part one, we took a look at a couple of the ghost ships that have crashed or have wrecked around the coastline of Australia. There's been the Sirius, the HMS Sirius that came over in the first fleet and crashed off Norfolk Island. And then we were talking about the convict ship George III, where many convict men had lost their lives being trapped in the cages below deck. We also had the Dunbar that crashed at the gap where many souls have thrown themselves over the cliff edge. Everyone on board died except for James Johnson, who went on to save another life. And then we looked at the SS Yongala, which was a strange story of a ship that didn't have a radio and missed a communication that would have saved everybody on board from a terrible storm out in the sea and the ghostly stories that came along with these wrecked ships. Yes, part one was packed, and it's going to be quite the same for part two. I'm sure of it. Let's start with the first ghost story. This next story begins somewhat similar to a joke. A rabbi, a bishop, and a pearl walk into a bar. No, but this story does have a rabbi, a bishop, and the infamous Rosea Pearl, in the tale. The story begins in 1912. A cyclone was bearing down on Port Headland on the north coast of Western Australia. In the port that day was the passenger steamer Kumbana, pride of the Adelaide Steamship Company, much like the SS Yongala. The 3,726-tonne passenger steamer was scheduled to depart from Broome, 500 kilometres to the north. The captain decided that staying in port wasn't a good idea with the cyclone coming, that their chances were better out at sea. How wrong he was. The Kumbana steamed right into the path of that cyclone, much like the SS Yongala, and all 138 passengers on board never made it. Among those victims was a rabbi by the name of Abraham Davis well known in the area for his pearl buying. This was a time when Broome was a bustling town and many people were finding pearls. Davis had become rich. He'd actually taken over a bungalow that was owned by his brother-in-law, Mark Rubin. Mark Rubin had started the pearling empire and had had dozens of ships and divers. However, after he overextended himself and went broke in 1908, Davis took over what remained of the empire and built it on. He also took over the bungalow that was located in Broome. He really did the bungalow up and it looked more like a palace. Abraham Davis was a Jewish man and turned his bungalow into a makeshift synagogue where a covered veranda had an organ, the Jewish community would congregate there. In 1910, he transferred his business to Port Headland, but still stayed at the bungalow in Broome, right up until the fateful day that he boarded the Kumbana. It is believed that the pearl, the infamous Rosea, may have been in his possession when he went down on the Kumbana, but others speculate that it may have been left at this bungalow. Even today, nobody knows where the Rosea Pearl ended up. In 1914, the Anglican Church bought the bungalow as a residence for their bishop. He would be the first bishop in Northwest Australia, the Right Reverend Gerard Trower. He moved into the bungalow, but soon after wished he hadn't. He had sleepless nights and really didn't think that he needed to stay there as he travelled quite a lot. He spoke to the Anglican Church, but they'd already purchased it for him, so he was kind of stuck there. Soon after he moved into the home, he was awakened one night by a strange light and a breeze circulating the room, stirring up curtains 
and waking him from a deep sleep. He watched as a hazy, luminous figure entered the room. There was an aura around this figure. He didn't enter through the door, but through a solid wall. The bishop thought he may have been having a divine experience. Perhaps the Lord was coming to visit him and give him guidance for his future. No, it was a middle-aged man with a long beard, dressed in robes and a prayer shawl. He was a Jewish rabbi. Now, Bishop Trower must have really thought things were getting crazy. He wasn't visited by the Lord, but he was visited by a rabbi. Perhaps he thought his faith had been placed in the wrong area. How strange. But it was obviously the previous owner, Abraham Davis. He introduced himself as such to the bishop. And the bishop asked him, was there anything that he could help with? Why was he here? Well, Abraham Davis danced around it. He didn't tell him exactly why he was there and said there was no reason. Why would he need a reason to be in his old home again? But he visited many nights and would never answer the bishop's question of why he was there. The bishop heard the story about the pearl and had a feeling that perhaps Abraham Davis had come back from the dead to find his beloved pearl. Perhaps it was hiding somewhere in the bungalow. Now to understand the importance of the pearl, we have to look to its past. It was brought from the sea in 1905. It passed through many hands and had quite a legend, a trail of treachery and death in its wake before Abraham Davis acquired it. They believed that the pearl was cursed and that the black powers would bring bad omens and bad luck to all who touched it. The diver who claimed it originally had it stolen off him and the diver who stole it from him died. It was then sold off by another. It was believed to have been a man, a Jewish man, by the name of Mark Liebglid, a well-known pearler. But he, too, came foul. He died whilst he was on a boat. Three men approached him to sell him another pearl, but they were actually going to trick him and try and steal the rosé off him. However, when he got on board, they hit him with a large bottle. He fell over the side of the boat but hung on, but the three men saw this and hit him really hard to get him off the boat. And apparently, he was found shortly after, face down, in the water near Chinatown in Broome. There were people who witnessed the murder from the boat. Witnesses saw them get away with lanterns to the shore. Three men were arrested. Underwater. Gentlemen, this is Democracy Manifest. Have a look at the headlock here. See that chap over there? Get your hand off my penis! This is the bloke who got me on the penis before. For what reason? What is the charge? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese meal? I see that you know your judo well. Good one. Hagen's, Espada and Marquez and to be hung at Fremantle Jail. But a strange thing happened when they got to the gallows. When they had the caps placed down on their heads, it is believed that Esparta cried, No, I want to see. So the hangman took the caps off, and Esparta and Marquez began to quarrel. The confusion caused, apparently, the hangman to cry out like a child. And as this was happening, the chief warden stepped up to the gallows to try and stop Esparta from struggling, as he was now trying to grab at the rope. But unfortunately, at this point in time, the hangman pulled the lever. The men dropped and were stopped by the noose. However, the chief warden fell to his death. The pearl's reach was quite vast. You didn't even have to touch the pearl to be cursed. It also passed into the hands of another who committed suicide after owning it for some time. There was also a story written about it by Ian Idris called 40 Fathoms Deep, using the turbulent history as the basis for the story. Maybe worth a look. 
and many believe that the death of Abraham Davis was a result of his ownership of the Rosea. Very interesting. Well, the bishop was in no hurry to find that damn pearl. He didn't even bother to look. He figured, let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> let evil pearls stay where they are, so to speak. Well, we're not going to question the authenticity of a bishop. So let's just believe this one. But he also had others who saw it as well. Visitors to the bungalow would often see a man dressed as a rabbi wandering around the property, walking into bushes and through walls. Even the bishop's housekeeper reported it suddenly turning up in the kitchen and inspecting the food she was cooking. She'd been recorded as saying, Oh, I had a nice leg of mutton simmering away on the stove with a pot of potatoes and another of broad beans. I watched him bend over the stove and cast a suspicious eye over the contents of the pots. I think he was checking to see if the food was kosher and disappointed to find it was not. And other guests at a party had sworn that they'd seen a rabbi at the party running off with a plate of scones. The bishop departed the bungalow in 1927. Whoever moved in afterwards never commented about a ghost. And eventually, in 1980, the bungalow was demolished. Whether or not Rabbi Davis still haunts the area is unknown. And it's also unknown to this day where that rosea pearl is, whether it's under the dirt and the rubble that once was the bungalow in Broome, or is it lying at the bottom of the ocean with a kumbana waiting for someone to find it? But like the ring forged from the fires of Mordor, some things are better left unfound. Our next ghostly story is one quite interesting. Most of us have seen the movie Event Horizon. It was a 1997 film set in the year 2047, which is getting ever so closer. The story goes, we're very much advanced into the future and we now have spacecraft. And one of our spacecraft, human spacecraft, has gone missing around Neptune. They set out another spacecraft carrying Sam Neill and Lawrence Fishburne to go and investigate what happened to it. All crew on board are dead, but something is very alive. The actual ship. The ship takes on its own mind and has plans for itself and the new crew aboard it. Well, the Alchemist is very similar. It has a mind of its own. The Alchemist was thwarted from the start, taking way longer to build than any other ship from the same shipyard. In 1943, whilst it was being assembled, sections of the ship weren't fitting together. Equipment was breaking down. Workers were becoming sick. Many accidents were happening. They were calling it at that point a jinxed ship. Over the decades after it was made, it was constantly in for repairs, being sold numerous times and having many name changes. During the war, the alchemist known as Vigo Hanstein, during the war efforts was in the dock more than it was actually serving. But it still had plenty of time for a tragedy to happen on board. A 28-year-old woman, Maud Steen, a Canadian girl, was killed in Naples on board the Vigo by a Norwegian soldier. She first tried to join the Canadian Navy, but they wouldn't allow her as they didn't allow women. But the Norwegian Navy welcomed her, and that's how she was on board the Vigo. The brave young woman was determined to join in the fight alongside the Allies against Nazi Germany. However, it would lead to her own demise. It is not known why he killed her and then turned a gun on himself. But her parents say she was doing what she loved when she died. Another soul trapped upon the alchemist, perhaps. In 1961, while getting repairs, it collided with another ship in Bristol Harbour and was out for 11 months, while its bow and rest of its structure were being rebuilt. Shortly after, it was sold again to a Greek company who named it Alchemist. In 1963, it was on a voyage from Jakarta to Bunbury in Western Australia. However, she struck a reef around the area of Mardi, which is uncannily 
350 kilometres west of where Yeses Kumbana went down and about 1,500 kilometres north of Bunbury. Many locals came to help. It seems the captain was ordered not to take it. They were trying to get the ship to become upright again themselves. For days it sat there, not moving, until a salvage expert was flown up from Perth and helped them upright the ship. The ship was towed to Fremantle Harbour, where it mysteriously caught on fire while repairs were being made. The ship's captain and some of the crew were fined and weren't paying for the repairs. They weren't giving officials any idea as to why the fire happened and what they were doing. They weren't straight with any answers and this is why they were being fined. The company organised for a tow to Hong Kong where repairs would be a lot cheaper and a tug by the name of the Pacific Reserve set out with the alchemist attached to take them to Hong Kong. At first it was fine but then they reached choppy waters and the line snapped. This sent the alchemist drifting straight back onto the coast at Eglinton Rocks, 57 kilometres north of Fremantle. From here, many people and different companies have tried to get the alchemist off the rocks and every time they fail, whether lines would snap, equipment's damaged, rough seas and treacherous weather, people getting sick, they even had a Roman Catholic priest try and exorcise the damn ship, performing an exorcism to try and release the ship of its demon, unjinx it. Before he got started, he decided he would do a bit of fishing, but this turned disastrous when he threw his line in, the line came straight back and got him in the forehead. He had to be hospitalised. The exorcism was never done. A caretaker was employed to look after the ship while it was stuck on the reef. He went mad. After spending a lot of time alone on the ship, only a student and kept hearing noises. He left the ship and had to be committed to an asylum. His diary would be found later on in this story. Another team from Manila was sent to try and get the ship off the rocks and it had all kinds of troubles. Their boilers broke, everything went downhill. And while they were repairing this, they had two of their crewmen aboard the Alchemist to protect it from anyone trying to get on board as it was probably close to land on these rocks and perhaps a lot of people had been gawking at it <laughs> the past few weeks. But while they were on board, they encountered strange things. Tools that they'd been using were moved around, not where they'd been left. The constant smell of cooking was in the air, like someone was cooking on board the ship. But when they would investigate, there was nothing there. Sometimes when they went to move hoses, heavy hoses, they were quite light, as if some ghostly hands were helping them carry them. The two Filipino men put up with quite a lot, and then one afternoon, as the sun was setting, they sat down after a day's work, only to be disturbed by a large man in an oilskin coat walk past them. Steel door. That was it for them. They'd had enough. They wanted off. And they were replaced by more men the following day. The ghostly sightings didn't end there, with the following men also seeing the same man. They nicknamed him Henry, and many people saw Henry over the next few years. Anyone who was on board would come into contact with Henry if they were there quite long. It wasn't long before local tour operators cashed in on the ghostly happenings on board the Alchemist. Whichever way you look at it, the Alchemist either had a demon in it and was incredibly haunted or was just terribly jinxed. There's more stories. A clairvoyant went on board and said that she felt someone had had a tragic death. There was also a local personality, a man named Jack Sue, who had served in the Second World War in a special Z unit, had been in the army and was quite decorated and honoured. Jack was no stranger to the alchemist. He'd actually been on TV, presenting a show on Channel 9 called Down Under. He did an episode on The Alchemist and had actually filmed it back in the 60s. 
who'd also been an avid diver, who had dived around other wrecks in the past. So when posed with the question of the alchemist being haunted, he jumped at the chance to prove them wrong, as he was quite the sceptic. So he organised for a party to stay overnight with his family and many of his other friends and what they encountered shook them. As Jack Sue explains to Warwick Moss on The Extraordinary, it wasn't a dull evening. Was the Alchemos a dark, brooding hulk that some say is a ghost ship? Once proud, the steamer Alchemos lies deserted off the Western Australian coast. There lurks an evil presence. They say the Alchemos is a ghost ship. As being a... Uh... Uh, a, 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 an evil ship. Definitely a, an evil ship. It is said that Jack got very ill after spending the night on the Alchemist, as well as being involved in a car accident where it is said that his wife died. And there were other tragedies from the Alchemist. Partners who wanted to buy the ship for scrap, John Franatovic and Bob Hugel, had bad luck from the beginning. A tanker that they'd owned collided with another ship and Bob Hugel's health deteriorated. Swimmers who went out to see the wreck were caught in currents and almost drowned. Ships in the area or boats seemed to lose power to their engines and just conk out. And it seemed to mark people who'd been on board. Other people on board seemed to get sick. A diver who went to inspect it died suddenly. The fiancé of another diver died in a plane crash. Death was surrounding the alchemist and the skull of a missing swimmer who was well known for trying to cross between the mainland and Rottnest Island. The skull had washed up in the hull of the alchemist. It was identified by dental records. One morning, people from the mainland could see smoke coming from the funnel of the hull. It was as if the ship wanted to leave. Newspaper reporters wanted to get the scoop, so they went on board and found about six fires, all in a blaze on the ship. Another party of ghost hunters went aboard the ship and at 2am found themselves regretting this as they could hear a dog yapping. They searched everywhere aboard the ship to find this poor dog who may have gotten on board and not known how to get off. They spent their entire night searching for the dog until they found the captain's logbooks that had said on many occasions during the night he heard the sound of a dog yapping. Jack Sue found that logbook and had much to say on it. He went back to the alchemist for more investigating over the decades. He and his son Barry wrote a book named The Ghost of the Alchemist and it's quite a read. And thanks to Barry who uncovered his dad's footage, we get to see what the alchemist looked like decades and decades ago. And it was around 1991 that the hull finally disappeared. It had disintegrated from the sea water and the air, the winds and waves lashing at it. The two halves of the alchemist disappeared into the sea, but divers still go around trying to find it on those on the Eglinton rocks. Those who have come into contact with it before and had terrible encounters stay well away and recommend that you do too. But it is no longer that hulking ship that it used to be. Although I wouldn't put it past Henry not to scare the Dax off anybody who dares try and get up onto his ship. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed these episodes on the ghost ships of Australia. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And stay tuned for more criminals, cutthroats and convicts.